Hello, everybody. Welcome into another episode of the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. I am Ryan, warmly joined in week 15. Can you believe it? By Andrew Erickson and Derek Brown. Fellas, it is the first round of the fantasy playoffs for most folks. So hopefully these shows, for the folks who are still alive, we can add some value here as you try to move on in the playoffs and win that fantasy championship. We will waste no time with an intro. We will dive right in. It's the must-sit players of Week 15. And as we always do, we'll start with the running backs. Erickson, who you got? I'm going to sit Keaton Mitchell this week against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, I don't like the matchup. The Jaguars are one of the better teams against the run this season. And the, the usage has been trending okay for Keaton Mitchell, but even like last week, you know, he's still splitting carries with Gus Edwards in the first half. He had three carries. Gus Edwards had two. We saw Justice Hill actually play the most snaps in the game. So a lot of these running backs for Baltimore, it's really dependent on like, okay, like how is the game flow going? Like if they're up by a lot, okay, it's probably going to be Gus Edwards. If it's more back and forth, okay, Justice Hill plays a lot of snaps, so he doesn't get a lot of touches. Keaton Mitchell is my highest ranked Ravens running back, so if you have to start one, like he would be the guy I would lean towards, but it's just not a favorable spot where his usage hasn't been good enough even after the bye week as the best running back on the Ravens to really, hey, this is a smash spot for him because it's not. Like the matchup warrants, hey, running back in a committee in a bad matchup, probably want to shy away from Keaton Mitchell, even though he's been trending relatively positive in the last couple of weeks compared to the rest of the Ravens running backs. How wide is the gap for you between Keaton Mitchell and Gus Edwards in the same backfield? I mean, it's only a couple spots, uh, and that's just due to Gus Edwards just has the touchdown equity, where if he scores a touchdown, he's probably going to outscore Keaton Mitchell, but Mitchell's probably a safer bet when it comes to his total rushing yardage props, his receptions, his total touches. If you look at the rushing attempts that some of the books have put out, it's like eight and a half for Gus Edwards, it's nine and a half for Keaton Mitchell. So they're kind of throwing their hands up being like, hey, you, you want to guess which guy's <laughs> going to get more attempts? Like, good luck. So uh, again, I just would be very... I'm not bullish on either guy, really, especially just given the, the tough match, because the Jaguars will sell out to sell the run. Like, even how badly they're second. That's why I love them are in like, the passing game and the passing weapons in this matchup. Don't like the running backs. Debra, who's your first must-sit running back? Man, the guy that I, brought, I talked about last week, Worm, has Jerome Ford. Uh, he had a good week last week, but we are off of that this week. I mean, you look at the matchup. I mean, the Bears have just been electric. They've been amazing as a defense, and they've been stopping the run all year. Like, that's nothing new. So Jerome Ford facing this, this run defense, I mean, since week nine, sixth lowest explosive run rate allowed, 11th lowest rushing touchdown rate allowed. So even if you're saying, okay, well, he's not going to be that efficient, Maybe I can bank on the touchdowns. I don't think the touchdown's going to be there either for Jerome Ford. So I would be going other directions because he's probably, I mean, come on. At, at this juncture of the season, he's probably, I mean, maybe you're stuck with him as an RB2, but if he's your flex option, I'm going other directions this week. He's been really consistent. I was actually surprised, like, pulling up the, the game log to see what the numbers have been. But since the mm -hmm. bye week in week five, there's only been one week where he hasn't been between 10 and 16 points and half PPR scoring. So he's been in that, like, RB17, RB23 type range for a really long stretch here. And that's been sort of matchup dependent. So is it just that the Bears are that good of a matchup that it scares you off? Or that bad yeah. of a matchup, rather? No, it's absolutely that. The Bears are that bad of a matchup. And I think, like, I mean, we're going to talk about multiple Browns in the show, but I think this entire offense, you need to have concern about them because the Bears have been amazing, like, as a pass defense, as a run defense. Joe Flacco has been playing some really good – he's had some really good matchups so far, so they've been able to move the ball either through the ground or through the air. I don't know if that's the case this week. Erickson, it looks like you're in the staff rankings, uh, actually a few spots lower on Ford than Debra is. So you're kind of thinking the same thing with the matchup. Yeah, uh, not a matchup against. The, I mean, I just don't like this game environment in general. And Jerome Ford, like, mm -hmm. look, we have all the teams playing this week. So it's like, yeah, you talked about how Jerome Ford has kind of been that steady body. OK, like in that RB17, RB24 range. OK, well, there have been teams on bye weeks every single week, basically. So now you bump that down. OK, now he's more of an RB3 play and we're in the playoffs now. So like RB3 production may not get it done for you to come away with a win this week. Like you got to play your best guys and Jerome Ford more often than not is probably not going to be your best guy and best option this week, even as like a flex play. He's definitely more of a floor guy than a ceiling play. And again, if you're a dog as one of your matchups, like the eighth seed, like playing Jerome Ford's probably not going to help you. 
Yeah, that's a good point on the no bye weeks. It's great for fantasy managers. It's bad for fantasy analysts who have uh, more work to do. Let's go <laughs> to the next. Let's go to the next must sit running back. Erickson, who you got? Uh, Ken Walker uh, for the Seattle Seahawks. The Eagles are the number one defense versus running backs in terms of fantasy points allowed to the position. And Walker still in a committee with Zach Charbonnet. Um, it, it, the usage was really weird last week. It was kind of like flipped where Charbonnet actually saw more carries and Walker was used more in the passing game. So ideally, if you're playing Walker this week, that's what you'd like to see again. But given what we've seen during the beginning of the season where Charbonnet was the guy that was dominating all the routes. So I don't know if this was, hey, Charbonnet was less removed or less time removed from his injury and Walker was more healthy. So they just had him playing more snaps. I'm just very hesitant to bind. Oh, yeah, Walker's going to be the pass catching guy in a matchup because neither guy's going to be able to run the ball effectively against the Eagles. I don't like that from a running back perspective. And when you look at Kenneth Walker's done, basically, outside a 64 yard receiving touchdown he had a few weeks ago, he's pretty much been doing nothing. Like half point finishes over the last five games 30, 55, 55, and 33. And the RB5 finish was when he had the 64 yard receiving touchdown. Like besides that one play, he's really done nothing for fantasy. And a lot of his season long stats are front loaded based on all the touchdowns he was scoring at the beginning of the season. So Ken Walker, again, committee, bad matchup. Like these are the spots you want to avoid running backs in. You're not seeing all the touches. You need to see the volume to get over the bad matchups. And that's not the case here with any Seattle running back. Yeah, qu- quickly, Debro. Um, just since there might be some people listening who are illuminated and just you know like the show, what, what's your standing on Kenneth Walker in Dynasty right now, given all we've seen this year? Oh man, he's such an interesting case. Like I was gonna say, like I had so many reservations about trading him away in so many leagues uh, to begin the year because he was just crushing. But to be honest, I mean, look. E- you're probably holding him if you got him. If you can lump him into a trade and get rid of him, I'm totally fine with doing that because, I mean, I, I don't feel good about him. I mean, like, what's the read on the Seattle backfield both this season and next season? Like, could we see the the usage flip? Could, I mean, we don't even know who the, you know, is Gino the quarterback next year? What does this offense look like? It's just a lot of question marks about Kenneth Walker. I mean, very curious to see where his dynasty stock goes next year, as well as where we're going to be drafting him in, in redraft ADP guys. Like I mean, we're, he feels like a guy that that's probably going to end up in that like round five, round six conversation. I mean, am I wrong about that, Erickson? Do you think he's going to, he, he goes a little bit higher than that? No, he's probably going to be a dead zone back. Um, but I, yeah, I think that's probably gonna be for the out. wrong reasons because at the end of the day, like we know he's good. Like, he is a good running back. Like, I don't think that's something that's up for debate. Obviously, like, the usage is going to fluctuate depending on how Seattle wants to deploy their backfield, et cetera, the health of their running backs. Like, the health thing has been a big thing with him. Like, he's been hurt the last two years, like, multiple points during the season, so that's always a concern. But there's no question that when he's in good matchups, he's super explosive. And I think that matters, especially when it's going to be him versus some of these, like, older, dustier veteran running backs that quote-unquote project for more volume. I'm going to be probably Mm -hmm. leaning towards Walker in those head-to-head situations. Feels like a guy who might be frustrating to roster next year, but then all it takes is one Charbonnet injury, and all of a sudden he's a you know lock in top ten guy again. So, yep. um, you know, obviously that's a long ways away, but I was just curious your opinion there. While Ken Walker's fantasy stock has gone downhill. Speaking of downhill, I've told you guys before that arguably the single biggest reason I moved to Denver is for the skiing. There's absolutely nothing I love more than getting a cabin in the mountain for a couple of days, heading up with some good friends and hitting the slopes. The only thing better, capping off the day with a beer, but not just any beer, Miller Lite, the 96 calorie beer that tastes like beer and is perfectly brewed for everything fall has to offer. I've said this before, but if I'm ranking possible settings for a beer, that first post shower, post ski day beer is my 101 cracking that miller light just hits different of course if you're skiing with my friends that might not be your first miller light of the day more often than not we're cracking one in the ski lift as well getting up for early first tracks riding up that lift with a few miller lights stashed away in your pockets yeah that's always a good call so the next time you want to make the most of your winter memories whether you're at an ugly christmas sweater party enjoying the game with pals or sharing laughter on the slopes live those winter moments with miller light with the miller light in your hand winter doesn't just taste great it tastes like miller time to get miller light delivered right to your door visit millerlightcom slash fantasy pros that's millerlightcom slash fantasy pros or you can find it pretty much anywhere that sells beer celebrate responsibly miller brewing company milwaukee wisconsin 96 calories and 3.2 carbs per 12 ounces debra who's your next must sit running back 
Well, I, I need to bounce a question off you real quick here, Worm. That post ski beer, does that happen in the shower? Because I'm a big fan of shower beer and shower bourbons. Like, just saying, <laughs> when it's been a rough day or, or you've shower been on the slopes. Bourbon. I, I have never yeah. uh, gotten, gotten quite that oh, far. Oh, baby. So, uh, life hack. We're going to go, we're going to go, <laughs> quick, quick story here. The, you, do you, have you ever seen the um, the little dispensers like that you can get that uh, can give you like dispense mouthwash, things like that? Yeah. You could set those up in your shower, and I'm not going to confirm or deny whether I have this in my house, but you could set that up in your shower and just pour bourbon in it and have it dispense shots, you know, while you're taking a shower. Just hypotheticals I'm throwing out This here. is very reminiscent of Kramer, like, cooking in the shower in Seinfeld. <laughs> it's like, ma- preparing a salad in the shower is... Uh, <laughs> I, it's it's just not an area I think of for for bourbon. Maybe I need to expand my horizons. But more often shower, than not, if if yeah. I'm having a drink in the shower, it's going to be a beer and it's going to be a Miller Lite. Uh, usually skiing though, it's post shower. It's not during shower. Um, Tell you, uh, man, you haven't lived. It's got to be in the shower. Just <laughs> maybe, saying. Maybe, just maybe I'll try there. that at the at the uh, fantasy pro ski trip this uh, this January. Uh, Devo, give me your next must sit running back. Well, I don't even know if this guy needs to suit up the cleats. I don't even know if he needs to, you know, worry about the post-game shower because he's not going to have a great day. Brian Robinson, man, even if he plays this week, and I know he's doing with a hamstring injury, if he plays this week, you got to sit him, man. The Rams have been a tough run defense uh, since week nine, ninth lowest explosive run rate. And we've seen Brian Robinson, like he's had some good games. A lot of that's been volume driven or it's been good matchups. And we, but we've also seen him fail in great spots. I mean, a la the first time they played the Giants. So I do not want to play a dinged up Brian Robinson in a terrible matchup. So no, he's going to stay on the bench this week, boys. Now, Eric said it looks like you don't have Robinson ranked. Is that because you're anticipating he doesn't play? Correct. Until guys pra- like prove to me that you're healthy, like you don't deserve to be back mm-hmm. in the rankings until you practice. And the fact that they had a bye week and didn't practice, like that's the biggest yep. red flag you could ask for a guy coming off a bye week not practicing right away. That usually means they're not going to play. So, uh, I'll stick with you, Erickson, for your next must sit guy. I'm going to continue with the theme here of sitting committee running backs in bad matchups. Deontay Foreman took over or reclaim the RB1 duties for the Bears last week coming off of his injury, worked ahead of Khalil Herbert and Roshan Johnson. Um, But that doesn't mean you should start him, even though, again, he's my highest ranked Bears running back. It is not by a lot, and he's still ranked very, very low on the running back totem pole in the rankings this week. I mean, his ACR is still really low as well, but you just can't play him against the Browns, like especially playing the Browns on the road. Like the Browns defense is beatable when they're playing away from Cleveland, but in Cleveland, like this Browns defense is elite and no one can store points on them. So they've allowed the seventh fewest rushing yards per game on at, at home this season. Uh, and I just think that with Foreman not really seeing enough volume while splitting touches with Roshan and Khalil Herbert to some extent, like you're just hoping he falls in the end zone. And it's a game where the total is not really that high because we don't project a lot of scoring in this spot. And Justin Fields is always a candidate to run it in himself. So I want to get away from Deontay Foreman in places where I can. He's RB 36 in half point PPR ECR. Is that too high, too low, or just right? Uh, I mean, I think it's just right. And again, it's 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 telling because he's a starting running back and he's RB 36. Like, like he's like on the bottom of the RB three tier. It's like, hey, you're literally only playing him unless you have no other starting running backs on your team. I know I have a dynasty team where I'm looking at Deontay Foreman versus Josh Kelly in my lineup, but well, <laughs> Foreman's getting the nod because I lost. I, I don't know if Pacheco's going to play, so yeah. uh, that's that's kind of where I'm turning to. So yeah, Deaver looks like you're even lower on on Foreman. Uh, so I, I he was dropped in ECR a little bit. I just adjusted my rank. I've got him in the same kind of it's in the same area code. Like I've got him at RB29. I think that he's going to be an RB3 for me this week. Now. Where he kind of falls in that ilk of RB3s is still left to be uh, decided. But somewhere in the mid-RB3 range, I think, is right. Debra, who's your last must-sit running back? Oh, man. Uh, Last guy I'm going to talk about here is James Conner. And James Conner, I'm going to be below consensus. I'm going to make sure I'm below consensus. Because what are the paths? Like, we talked about James Conner previously on this show. And, okay, like, whoa, he went out against the Steelers and he scored two touchdowns and he had a lot of volume. Okay, that feels like the outlier. If you look at the rest of the season for James Conner, and this is not a James Conner problem. This is an Arizona Cardinals problem. They're not giving him enough volume on a weekly basis that we can count on. He's not getting pass game usage. And if you line all that up with this week, 
San Francisco is a really stellar run defense, man. Since week 10, they've allowed the fourth lowest missed tackle per attempt rate, second, and they had the second highest stuff rate. So in a game where I, I just think the 49ers are going to truck stick the Cardinals in this one, Kyler Murray's not playing good football. The 49ers are rolling. Their defense is top shelf. If James Conner's not getting checkdowns, if they're in trail mode, he's not going to score touchdowns. I mean, what are we talking about here, guys? Like, he's an RB3, and there's a bunch of RB3s that I would rather even start over James Conner this week. So, it's just not a spot or a player, and I hate it because if you look at all of his efficiency metrics, James Conner's blowing the doors off, man. He's playing really good football, but the Cardinals are simply just not using him enough, and the matchup's terrible. Yeah, uh, you said uh, if they're trailing, I, they will be trailing. It would be stunning yeah. if, if they won't be trailing this this entire game pretty much. So I, I'm in lockstep with you. I, I'm i actually surprised he's even ranked as highly as he is um, You know, in ECR. He's RB26. I, I think there's definitely going to be 30 guys that I would rather – like you guys said, there's no bye weeks this week, so there's more options. I, I don't think he would be inside my top 30. I don't have to do rankings, so I, I can say that and not, uh, you know, have to put my uh, my money where my mouth is. But um, yeah, I just don't like the matchup at all, Erickson. What do you think about Connor? Yeah, no, I mean, it's it really depends on. Again, I don't know what the status of like Demarcado. I know that he got hurt before their bye week and he was operating on third downs. But even if he doesn't play, like Michael Carter has been kind of like dabbling in on third down. So that's like the concern, obviously, in a game where you're projecting the Cardinals to be trailing. It's not a positive game script for James Conner, who got his, you know, he delivered for the Steelers or against the Steelers because they were winning in that game and he was able to run the ball effectively. So he's not catching dump off passes. Then it's going to be a, an uphill battle for him. Demarcado limited on Wednesday with a neck issue. So maybe he plays. We'll see. Let's use the Who Do I Start tool. This is free to use at fantasypros.com slash start. Anybody can head there, put in your own starter sit questions up to four players at a time. You can even pick and choose which experts your decision draws from. Again, this is free to use at fantasypros.com slash start. It's the Who Do I Start tool. I will throw some name comparisons your guys' way. Erickson, Keaton Mitchell, or AJ Dillon this week? Oh my God. <laughs> AJ no. Dillon is like, I I just like laugh every time I look at AJ Dillon's like his his uh his scores because it's the same thing every single week. It's like <laughs> RB twenty four, RB twenty four, RB twenty two, RB twenty nine. Like, you know what you're gonna get out of AJ Dillon? Like you're gonna get like RB two, RB three production. So there is some safety to that, but then you have to look at the matchup and it is definitely worse because it's the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and for some reason AJ Dillon just can't ever find the end zone <laughs> so in this case i would probably lean on mitchell as more of an upside play just because he's more explosive he plays on the ravens offense i think the ravens can put up more points just overall against the jags so i actually think that in my rankings i actually do have mitchell one spot ahead of AJ. yeah i have one spot ahead of aj dylan so again dylan definitely comes with more of a floor um but mitchell i, I want that upside in the playoffs He's also one spot ahead in ECR, so it's sure. kind of a similar range there. Also in that range is Kenneth Walker. So I'm going to ask you Kenneth Walker or Clyde edwards Hilaire, who's right behind those guys in ECR. Uh, I'm taking edwards Hilaire As long as Pacheco's out, um, I know that edwards Hilaire kind of split usage with uh, Jarek McKinnon, but look, the Chiefs, if they're winning in this game, I think that he has more touchdown equity. Uh, I think that he still gets the touches inside the five-yard line where McKinnon is just kind of like more of the – red zone guy like when they're inside the 20 he gets more of these you know passes out of the backfield so i'll lean on edwards hilaire on the chiefs offense down to foreman or gus edwards uh gus edwards just i think he has more touchdown equity i'd rather bet on the again betting on the ravens offense to steamroll the jags versus the bears on the road against the yeah. browns d bro jerome ford or Najee harris I'm going Najee on this one um i think the steelers learned their lesson like last <clears throat> last week with Trevor Trubisky, they decided to want, they wanted to pass the ball and run fast at the beginning of the game. Mike Tomlin's going to be like, uh-uh, I watched that game tape. We're not doing that again. We're going slow. Yeah. We're going to feed Najee. We're going to feed Jalen Warren. And we're going to try to grind out a win. So the matchup's pretty good for Najee, so I'm going to go with him. How about James Conner or Jerome Ford? Oof. All of my least favorite things. Uh, I'll go Connor here uh, because Connor at least doesn't have to deal with Kareem Hunt possibly vulturing a touchdown. And then assuming that he plays Brian Robinson or Antonio Gibson in the same backfield. Woof. Uh, give me B-Rob. I have 
I have no faith in Antonio Gibson at all. Like I've, I, I get it. Like uh, he he's been in the primer <laughs> every week this year, but uh, I don't like it. Don't like him. Mm-mm. He's done. No, right. He's done nothing all year. Yeah. Let's move to the must sit wide receivers here. Erickson, starting with you. Drake London. Uh, I don't care what he did last week because that was last week and this is this week. And the matchup is totally different against Carolina. This is not the Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense. That is a pass funnel. Carolina is a run funnel. And they have a very underrated secondary. So with the Falcons playing on the road against a defense that Arthur Smith can game plan, knowing that I can run the ball 40 times if I want to (laughs) and win this game. Like, I do not have to have Desmond Ritter drop back to throw five or ten times at all in this game. He doesn't need to throw the ball to beat the Panthers on the road, especially with actually just projecting for some weather in this game as well. So I think that, yes, London was so great last week, but that was because of the matchup. And he is a matchup-dependent wide receiver. As good as he is, you know, when he came down with that deep ball from Ritter in the second half of last, I was like, oh, my God, dude, Drake London is that guy. But in this spot where in week one, he had zero catches against the Carolina Panthers, like no one's going to be surprised when we look up and be like, wow, He was a bust against Carolina because the matchup does not dictate starting him. So it seems crazy to bench a guy that had about 170 receiving yards last week, but it was against the Bucs. And this week is against the Carolina Panthers. And it's not like London has been this super consistent wide receiver in fantasy because he's attached to Desmond Ritter in an offense that wants to run the football. So against the Panthers, especially on the road where London has been putting up worse numbers, he's only gone over 50 yards on the road twice this season in six road games. Uh, I've got to sit Drake London. Yeah, Debra, you're actually more in line with consensus. Erickson is well below ECR on Drake London. Uh, you're just like, is you're not buying in solely based on last week, right? You just kind of maybe like the matchup better. What's your reasoning there? Uh, I think, I, I mean, there's only so far down that I can get him. I mean, I think like he's in that wide receiver three ilk. Um, just it's a bet on talent. But I, I mean, I'm with Erickson overall. I mean, I'm not massively in love with drake london i it, the closer we get to sunday i will double check ecr and if i'm in line i'm going to bump him a few spots below that because i agree with everything erickson said debra sticking with you for your first must sit wide receiver oh good lord what has been the roller coaster ride that has been calvin ridley all year it's been good it's been great it's been terrible you don't know whether to put your arms up and go Wee! or vomit in a trash can. It's been horrible, man. I mean, you're like, do I start him? Do I not? Oh, great. I didn't put him in my lineup this week. And he goes off. It's been horrible. I do not think he goes off in this matchup, man. And and Worm can attest. Baltimore Ravens secondary is hashtag good at football, baby. I mean, you look at since week nine against boundary wide receivers, fifth fewest PPR points per target, 11th lowest receiving yards per game. None of this spells good times and all the points for Calvin Ridley sit him this week. I know that Gabe Davis is like the roller coaster wide receiver of the season. Like he has that title. Man. Calvin Ridley might be number two. I mean, he has not mm-hmm. had a finish this season between, I think it's our, uh, wide receiver nine and wide receiver 27. Every other game, he has been either mm-hmm. ahead or behind those numbers. So there's just no wide receiver two finishes that he's had all year. It's, it's actually kind of stunning that a wide receiver could do that in the season. Yep. Uh, it's, you hit the nail on the head, remarkable. man. He's got four weeks as a wide receiver one this year, um, and he's got five games outside of the top 50. Yeah. Fun times, fellas. Fun times. Yeah. Erickson, what do you make of Ridley this week? I mean, I want to play him. I, I mean, yeah, he's. we've been calling him Gabe Davis South for a while. <laughs> like, that, Ooh, like, that's who he has God, been that hurts all so season much. long. So, <laughs> I, actually, you know, as a, as a take for, for next year, I think that Calvin Ridley could actually be, like, this year's, like, Cortland Sutton where everybody was a year too early on him, you know, first year coming back again, inconsistent. But when you just look at like his usage, again, I don't know what is exactly his expected fantasy points is, but I'm sure it's really high because every single week he sees high value targets. He sees a ton of air yards, he sees a ton of the end zone targets, the red zone targets. And that's what Cortland Sutton saw a lot last year, but he just didn't convert on those opportunities. So again, he's going to be discounted heavily next year because of how inconsistent he's been. But it may be a case of, hey, man, like he missed so much time in football. Like, why are we surprised that he was a little bit rusty and inconsistent? So just something to keep in mind as we uh, move forward. But in this particular matchup, uh, <laughs> I don't want any pieces of Calvin Ridley. Erickson, 
Give you a guess. Where do you think Calvin really is? Wide receiver what in expected fantasy I, points per I, game? I, you I, maybe looked this up and, oh, good Lord, I'm so intrigued. <laughs> he's definitely inside the top 10. I'll say oh, seven. Oh, he's close. Uh, wide receiver 16, baby. Oh, 16? <laughs> I thought he'd be higher, yeah. actually. Yeah. Um, but still, yeah. And versus his, his actual, which is what, like in the 30s? Probably. Yeah, he is uh, actually he's wide receiver twenty eight in fantasy okay. points per game. So, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. He's twenty. He's wide receiver twenty five in total fantasy points, but that's because he's played. Uh, he hasn't every missed week. any games. Surprisingly, yeah. <laughs> that's one uh, thing he actually has been healthy. So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> which is something. Uh, Erickson, give me your next must sit receiver. Uh, George Pickens. Uh, you cannot start George Pickens if Mitchell Trubisky is anywhere near the football in, in a in a game so if you just look at historically this year and last year in the games where trubisky's played the most snaps looking at the targets pickens has in those games three two seven three five and six so like you're betting on okay pickens is going to get like five targets <laughs> maybe Fryermuth gets more targets deontay johnson gets more targets like you're just razor thin margins with George Pickens and it was shocking last week they actually caught five passes um but he got 19 yards against the Patriots like and that was a good matchup so again the Colts necessarily aren't this juggernaut defense that I'm super afraid of but they're still allowing the eighth fewest receptions per game to wide receivers so I just don't want to put any trust I have in Mitchell Trubisky with George Pickens again he had five catches last week for 19 yards like what are you missing by benching George Pickens. There's just no upside without the amount of volume that he's going to get because he's going to be behind Deontay. And Debro hit on it earlier when we were talking about some of these Steelers running backs where, you know, they're going to run the football. Like, that's, I think, their game plan, not, hey, let's unleash Mitchell Trubisky. Like, we saw that on Thursday night. It did not work. And Mike Tomlin, again, you know, that seat is hot. Like, he's like, man, I got to get the ball out of Trubisky's hands into my running back. So I'm going to sit George Pickens. Erickson, you don't want to invest in George Pickens, who uh, his A dot last and this this floored me when I pulled this oh, yeah. up for the primer. It's crazy. His A dot was <laughs> three point two. I, I got no words, no, man. Trust me, I was annoyed because I had the under on his reception props. I'm like, why is he getting all these screen passes? <laughs> like, this it's is like crazy. We've never seen this before. It obviously didn't crazy. work because he got 19 yards. Um, but yeah, don't play George Pickens. Yeah, you guys are all in lockstep with him uh, outside the top 40. So we, we can move on from Pickens to Debro's next player, who I don't understand why he's ranked as high as he is in consensus. He's basically the twin brother of Calvin Ridley, um, except maybe the ugly twin brother. Uh, we'll see. Oh, rude. Uh, man, Terry McLaurin season has been terrible. It's it's he's gotten a boatload of volume and he's done absolutely nothing with it. You look at this year, nineteen percent target share, one point four yards per route run. I mean, he hasn't finished as a top thirty six wide receiver in fantasy since week nine. That. Just, just let that soak in for a second. Why do we keep ranking him and we see him in ECR like in the 20s, the high 20s? Like th there's just no way, man. Like especially if you look at the Rams since week nine, perimeter wide receivers, ninth fewest PPR points per target. Like if you're looking for a commander's wide receiver to start on a weekly basis in the playoffs, it is not Terry McLaurin. It's actually Curtis Samuel. Yeah, D Debro, it's it's worse than you said. He hasn't finished in in the top 42 in the last, you know, since week nine. It's been so wide bad. receiver 50, 42, 46, 119. But he's not pairing it with the high end games either. His best finish Ooh. this year is wide receiver 15. He doesn't have any wide receiver one finishes on the season. This Terrible. is in half PPR, by the way. He has not topped 15 points in a game this season. Again, in half PPR. I mean, it's it's. Just been bad. Like he's 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 not playable. I don't understand why he's ranked in the top thirty in ECR right now. Erickson, where do you have him? I have him right around thirty. Um, and I, I, think I just that, don't get it. Well, I mean, I think it's just looking at the total of the game. Like, I mean, this has a fifty point total essentially against the Rams. Like, this game's probably going to shoot out. And again, you're talking about McLaurin. He doesn't score. He hasn't scored a lot of touchdowns. Like you could say, you make the argument that's going to regress just based on the amount of volume that he's seeing. I mean, he's two weeks removed from a, an 11 target game. We know Sam Howell loves to throw the football and yeah, he's been really bad, but eventually those opportunities are going to convert into some type of production. And what better bet to make than in a game with like a 50 point total where they're going to have to be throwing the ball. I and mean, you look at the Rams, like they've been really, they've been a lead against slot receivers. Like, so is it really a Curtis Samuel game? Like, why can't it be a McLaurin game? So I think that he still has upside. Um, but 
but yeah, I understand. I, I understand more why he's saying wide receiver 30. I mean, to, yeah, to be fair, I probably wouldn't be starting. It's not like I'm saying, oh, you need to start Jahan Dotson instead, or, or I, I know Debra's Well, that's what I mean. It's like, it, it's somewhat, like Washington's going to funnel targets in the passing game to somebody, so we don't want to start Dotson. It's probably going to just be like a lot of check down San Antonio Gibson or something like that like tight end stuff like that like it's, yeah I, it's gonna be in the middle of the field like i, I i'll straight up say I'll, I'll, i'm gonna rank curtis samuel over terry mclaurin i'm not I, i've got yeah. terry mclaurin right now as my wide receiver 41 and considering all of his finishes over the last few weeks guys it might be a little bit generous generous to be honest I, I i love the player and like i have him in a dynasty league Same. where i need to win this week because the playoffs don't start till next week so like i'm not like i'm a terry mclaurin guy i just I, the proof is kind of in the pudding, right? Like we haven't seen the upside and we've seen a lot of downside really this whole season. Like, um, like just, if I were to come out and told you that Sam Howell was going to be top three in basically every passing metric, we would have all said to walking into this year, like, look, like if you just knew that that was the only information you had, wouldn't we all say, well, Terry McLaurin's probably a top 20 wide receiver, right? But it, it's not the case. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we were as aggressive as it is drafting McLaurin and Dotson. I mean, they were both going in the top, what, like six or seven rounds in drafts this year. By the end, Dotson moved up a lot late in August, and obviously mm-hmm. that was a huge miss as well. Let's move to the next wide receiver who has also shown a fair bit of downside this season. Erickson. Uh, T. Higgins. Uh, last two weeks, he has five catches for 105 yards. Uh, so the yardage is good. The volume is really bad, though. He has seven targets. Um, he has two games this year where he's been better than wide receiver 30. Um like Higgins, I think I was looking at like an all bus team and he's on it like because he was a oh, second yeah. round pick and oh, yeah. I mean, he's done absolutely nothing. He's been hurt. Joe Burrow's obviously been hurt. And look, if Jamar Chase is going to be inconsistent, then you can't have any faith that T Higgins is going to be consistent in any way. And I know we had a touchdown callback last week, but that actually wasn't from Browning. Like that was from AJ McCarron. Like Browning didn't throw him the ball in the end zone. So against this Vikings defense that has been just red hot against opposing offenses. If you just look at, they're allowing the sixth fewest fantasy points per game to wide receivers over the last four weeks. I mean, Devontae Adams had done nothing against them the entire game until like the last drive of the game when he caught a long pass. So T Higgins, like Jamar Chase, you're hoping just delivers because he's so talented. Talented, whereas T Higgins, I think this is a lost year for him. I feel bad for the guy in real life just because he his fantasy or his free agency stock just tanked because he just put up a horrible season statistically. So someone might get a deal um in free agency. But yeah, for me, T. Higgins, like he's in the like wide receiver 30s. I have him like wide receiver like 55. Like I I don't want any part of T. I've Higgins. I've got him at 45. And, like, I'm, I'm I, with you, Erickson. And maybe 55 is too low, but I'm just like I, I have him at a point where I'm like. I'm not even considering T. Higgins like a, an option this week. Mm-hmm. Like I'm like, he's on firmly on my bench, if not on my waiver wire. I mean, he he was wide receiver 34 last week. It was his third best game of the season, <laughs> like by a decent amount. Like that's really all wow. you need to say. Like that's just the kind of year. Now there's been some injuries in there. It's not like he's played every week, of course, but it's just been that kind of year for him. Um, it's really tough. Also, just on this matchup specifically, like I don't know that I really trust uh, Browning or McCarron to face off against his Vikings like pass rush I think is gonna kind of murder them so like even if he had been playing well I would be a little hesitant given you know young quarterback and experienced quarterback against a defense like this stylistically so yeah I'm fully with you on T Higgins Debra give us the last must sit receiver well, I talked about him. I loved him last week, and he let me down. I'm not playing Amari Cooper this week. Uh, the target share was definitely there. I mean, look, he got a 31% target share last week, 51% air yard share from Joe Flacco. That volume probably still remains this week, but good luck trying to do anything with it. I mean, again, talking about this Chicago Bears pass defense. They're playing out of their minds, man. You look over the last few weeks since week nine, seventh fewest PPR points per target to perimeter wide receivers, second fewest receiving yards per game to perimeter wide receivers. So people need to understand, toss out all of your pre-misconceptions about the Bears defense. They've been good against the run all year since week 11 week 9 they've been amazing against the pass i want nothing to do with the cleveland browns offense this week quickly erickson where are you at on cooper i have him kind of in that just wide receiver two range look every time that i try to doubt this guy he always like just comes through so again i'm not gonna rank him super super low and i understand you have to play him but again it's not like a, a ceiling spot against i think the bears who are I think very underrated defensively on on both the pass and the run. Erickson, Drake London or Brandon Cooks this week? I am going to start Drake London. 
but I don't feel George, good about it. George Pickens or T. Higgins? <laughs> I believe you have both these guys in the 50s. <laughs> Jeez. Rather start Michael Wilson. I'd rather, like, I don't want to start either of these guys. Like, give me a Cardinals receiver that should see volume. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll start. Uh, I, I guess I probably should. I have Pickens ranked ahead, so let's go with him. Uh, and then for the folks who get to this show early before Thursday Night Football, is Josh Palmer ahead of both of those guys? Yes. Yeah, I, I figured. Mm. As much, Debro, Amari Cooper or Garrett Wilson? Oh, uh, it's Garrett Wilson. Good Lord, I'm 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 investing Zach in the arm good of Zach Wilson. Eh, versus the Texans, Relative man. to Zach Wilson. Oh, I was fixing to say, good for <laughs> Zach Wilson is like, oh, okay, yeah. you can play quarterback like a D3 guy. Cool. Yeah, I I lost. Uh, well, I have Stroud, like obviously in concussion protocol, so I guess it's not clear yet what's going to happen with him. But I had to pick up Zach Wilson in a couple of leagues for the playoffs this week, which was a very oh, very tough feeling. Good luck, good yeah. luck, Worm. That's all I can say. Good yeah. luck, uh, Calvin Ridley or Terry McLaurin. Ew, I'll Gosh, take Calvin I, Ridley. I'll, I'll go Terry, Ridley. dude. No, I, I would go Ridley. I, honestly, I, even I'm against going, the Ravens I'm going defense, Ridley. I did, I have no faith in Terry McLaurin. I, and I think other players in this game are going to pop off. I know I've been very down on Brian Robinson, and I'm down on McLaurin. That's also because I'm high on some other players for the Commanders this week. Let's quickly go through the quarterbacks, tight ends, and defenses here. Erickson, who are you sitting? Uh, Tua Tungo Viola. Uh, he's playing the Jets at home. He was QB 26 the last time he played them. Um, he's not been better than QB 9 since week 6. And Terry Kill is banged up. Uh, look, if Hill's not playing, like, you can't stay, play Tua. And even with Hill against the Jets, like, Tua was not that great. So, again, Tua's had a lot of great matchups over the recent weeks and has been okay at best. So, again, I think that the Staffords of the world are better plays than, than Tua is this week. Mm-hmm. And then your tight end in defense. Yep. Uh, so Kyle Pitts is going to be my tight end to sit. He scored last week. Uh, again, it was a great matchup against the Buccaneers. Not the case with the Panthers. Elite defense against tight ends. Allowing second fewest catches per game to tight ends. They've also allowed the fewest fantasy points per game to tight ends aligned in the slot. Where Kyle Pitts runs a lot of his routes. So he's held the two catch for 44 yards the last time he played the Panthers back in week one. So I want to get away from all Falcons pass catchers if I am able to do so. And then my DST I want to sit is the Jaguars. The Ravens have allowed the fewest points to fantasy DSTs the last four weeks. Sixth fewest on the season. So Jaguars secondary is just so bad. It's going to get roasted by the Ravens. By the way, on to uh, uh, this is why I was kind of fading the idea of trading for Dolphins all season. If you look at the you know, with the projected matchups coming up, it's all red. It's Jets. It's Cowboys. It's at Baltimore. Week 18 is the Bills, which won't matter for fantasy, but it's a really tough stretch for the Dolphins. Are you mm-hmm. starting this week, Tua or Russ Wilson? Come on, man. Um, you know you want to say Russ. Go Russ. Yeah, I guess I'll yeah, I guess I'll start Russell Wilson against the Lions. In at Coors Field. The four of course, in the NFL. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> uh, Kyle Pitts or Pat Fryermuth. Fryermuth. Debro, who you got for quarterback, tight end, and defense? Man, so if I'm down on Ridley, I'm down on his quarterback. Trevor Lawrence, I'm sitting in. Baltimore's been a terrible matchup for quarterbacks all year. They're allowing the third fewest yards per attempt and third lowest CPOE. So sitting Trevor Lawrence, uh, tight end. I don't want people chasing the one-off, so I got to bring him up here. Hunter Henry, do do not pick him up. Do not play him. Do not pass go. Do not collect the (laughs) Hunter Henry dollars this week. He is not going to lead you to the promised land. Kansas City, sixth fewest fantasy points per game to opposing tight ends and six fewest receiving yards per game allowed to tight ends. And as far as the defense, man, we started off the year pretty high and they were playing good. The Detroit Lions, mm-mm, man, mm-mm, playing terrible as a defense. Since week 11, their DST 30 in fantasy points per game. There's only two defenses worse than them. <laughs> There's no way I'm rostering them. These guys are back to back in ECR. Trevor Lawrence or Jared Goff? Golf. We will wrap up there. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Good luck here in the first round of the Fantasy Playoffs, or if your league is still in its regular season, good luck making the playoffs. For Erickson and Debro, I am Ryan Warmly. We'll see you again next time. <laughs>